Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. This time, we won't write any code. Instead, I will introduce you to 3D vector math, the math that we need to do 3D simulations. Of course, there are many textbooks on the subject. Here, however, I give you a very compact presentation which focuses precisely on the part that we need to do 3D simulations. In addition to the definitions of the concepts, I will also give you my personal intuitions behind them, which I developed over time. In the description, you will find a link to my 10 minutes physics page, as well as to the slides of the presentation. In order to be able to work in three-dimensional space, we need a coordinate system. Here, we have the x and the y axis on the ground and the z axis pointing upwards. We typically use a right-handed coordinate system, which means if the x-axis points along the thumb and the y-axis points along the index finger, then the z-axis points along the middle finger. Then a vector is just a combination of three components or coordinates. We can write them in column form, surrounded by square brackets, or as a single symbol, but then we use bold face. We can use vectors for two different things. First, we describe a position in 3D space, like the particle position, using x, y, and z. We can also use it to describe an arrow, like the velocity of a particle. Here you can see that the x component is negative, pointing against the direction of the x-axis. As I just mentioned, in mathematics, the coordinate system is oriented such that the x and y-axis are on the ground, and the z-axis points upwards. In graphics, the coordinate system is oriented such that the y-axis points upwards. As you can see, this is still a right-handed coordinate system. The reason for having the y-axis pointing upwards is that if we place a camera, the camera sees a two-dimensional coordinate system with the x-axis pointing to the right and the y-axis pointing upwards. The z-axis then points against us, which is also the reason why a depth buffer typically is called a z-buffer. To do simulations, we need vector operations. The first one is addition. We can use this to move forward in time. Let's say we have P, the position of a particle, and we want to add A. To do this, we can simply add all the components individually. A second operation is scaling. We can use this to go from a velocity to a position update. Scaling means that we multiply a vector by a simple number, here delta T. To do this, we simply multiply all the components individually. What's important to notice is that the scaled vector has the same direction as the original vector. A third operation is subtraction. We can use this to compute the vector from position A to position B. In order to do this, we subtract A from B. We can compute this vector by simply do the subtraction on all components individually. Note that in order to compute the vector from A to B, we have to subtract A from B and not B from A. Computing the length of a vector is pretty simple. We can just add the squares of all the components and take the square root. An important concept in simulation is a normalized vector, or a unit vector. This is a vector that points in the same direction as V, but has length 1. We can compute this vector by scaling the vector v by the inverse of its length. Finally, we have two very important operations, the dot product and the cross product. They are essential to do 3D simulations and 3D math in general. The dot product is an operation between two vectors. It's written as a little dot. To compute it, we compute ax times bx plus ay times by plus az times bz. As you can see, the result is a scalar or a simple number. This is also the reason why the dot product is sometimes called the scalar product. It is super simple to compute and very useful. A first very important use case is to compute the length of a vector v along a direction defined by a unit vector n. To compute the scalar value vn, we simply take the dot product between n and v. A second important use case is to decide whether two vectors are perpendicular to each other. In this case, their dot product is zero. A third important use case is to compute general vector components. Let's say we have a vector v and we want to compute its component along a direction defined by a unit vector n. To compute this, we measure the length of v in the direction of n and multiply n by this length. 
to get the vector Vn. We can compute the perpendicular component by simply subtracting Vn from the original vector V. Such a decomposition is important to handle restitution and friction effects. The cross product is also an operation between two vectors and is written as a little cross. As you can see, the result is a vector in contrast to the dot product where the result is a simple number. Here are the equations to compute the individual components of this resulting vector. The result a cross b is a vector that is perpendicular to both a and b. In a right-handed coordinate system, if a points along the thumb and b points along the index finger, then the result a cross b points along the middle finger. We can also use the cross product to compute the normal of a triangle. The normal of a triangle is a unit vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the triangle. To do this, we compute the vector from p1 to p2 and from p1 to p3. If we then take the cross product of these two vectors, we get a vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the triangle. Here I want to introduce a very important concept, the concept of an orientation of a triangle. If you curl the fingers of your right hand along P1, P2 and P3, then your thumb points into the direction of the normal of the triangle. Since the normal of the triangle is a unit vector, we have to normalize it. An oriented mesh is a mesh for which all triangle faces point outwards. To guarantee this, we have to define the faces in a certain way. For this tetrahedron, we have to define the bottom face as 3, 2, 1. If we define it as 1, 2, 3, the normal will point inwards, as you can verify with your right hand. So this is a valid definition of all the faces of the tetrahedron. This is another valid definition, because it doesn't matter at which vertex we start. Here we define the bottom face as 1, 3, 2, which also generates a normal that points out of the surface. We know that the cross product of the vectors a and b is perpendicular to the two vectors. However, does the length of this vector also have a meaning? The length of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram defined by the vector a and b. With this we can compute the area of a triangle in a very easy way. We first define the vector from p1 to p2 again and from p1 to p3. We then take the cross product and measure its length. The length is then two times the area of the triangle. So we can compute the area of the triangle with this simple formula. The cool thing is that we can use the cross product to compute the volume of a tetrahedron as well. So let's assume we have a tetrahedron defined by three vectors a, b and c. The length of a cross b is the area of the parallelogram defined by a and b as we just saw. With c we can define a parallel pipe. In order to compute its volume, we need its height, which is the projection of the vector c in the direction of a cross b. To compute h, we use the dot product. It's the dot product of the normalized vector a cross b and c. The length of a cross b is the area of the base phase. If we multiply this equation by a, we have a times h on the left hand side. This however is the volume of the parallel pipe. This means that we can compute the volume of the parallel pipe as a cross b dot c. Since the volume of the tetrahedron is one sixth of the volume of the parallel pipe, we have this nice formula to compute the volume of a tetrahedron. For simulations, we need vector transformations as well. A transformation can describe the motion of a rigid body or a soft body. Transformations are typically described by matrices. Here we have a 3x3 three three matrix. We can write the matrix as the two-dimensional array of components surrounded by square brackets or a single symbol. If we use a single symbol, we use a capital letter. We can multiply a matrix with a vector to get a new vector. For the first entry, we perform a dot product of the first row of the matrix with the vector. For the second entry, we perform a dot product with the second row and the vector. And the same for the third entry. We can construct a matrix that doesn't change the vector. This matrix is called the identity matrix and represented by a capital I. The formula for multiplying a matrix with a vector looked kind of arbitrary. Things get much more intuitive if we represent the matrix A by three column vectors. 
As you can see, the resulting vector is the first column times x1 plus the second column times x2 plus the third column times x3. I can write this in a more compact way by writing the matrix A as three column vectors A1, A2 and A3. For a general linear transformation, we multiply a vector V by a matrix A and add an offset vector B. Using column vectors for A, we get this form here. Now this form can be visualized in a very intuitive way. We can describe the vector V with three components Vx, Vy and Vz. Applying a transformation with B, A1, A2 and A3 means that we transform the vector V into a new coordinate system with its origin at B and the three new axes A1, A2 and A3. Now the resulting vector V is just the origin plus these scaled axes which means we land at this point here. As you can see, we transformed the vector v into this new coordinate system. What you can also see is that if the length of a1 is larger than 1, then things get stretched along the x-axis. If the length of an axis is smaller than 1, then objects get compressed in that direction. Also, if the axes are not perpendicular to each other, a shear is applied. Each matrix has a property called the determinant. There is a specific formula to compute it. This formula looks kind of arbitrary. However, there is a very nice interpretation of it using the columns of the matrix. It is basically just the volume of the parallel pipe spawned by the three axes. We can use this quantity to characterize our transformation. If the determinant is 1, the transformation is volume conserving. This is because the parallel pipe shows us how a unit cube is transformed by A. If the determinant is zero, however, all axes lie in a common plane. This means our transformation doesn't reach all the points in space. This also means that the inverse of the transformation does not exist. We can combine transformations. Let's say we have a vector x and transform it using matrix A. We can take the result and transform it using matrix B. We can combine these two transformations by multiplying B and A to get a new matrix C. As an example to compute the entry in C on the second row and first column, we take the dot product between the second row of A and the first column of B. Here is the explicit formula for this entry. The inverse of a matrix is a matrix that reverses a certain transformation. If we have a vector x and transform it using a matrix A and take the result and transform it with the inverse, then we end up at the same location. This means that the inverse matrix multiplied by the matrix is the identity matrix. The inverse of a matrix can be easily computed from the entries of A. For a general transformation using an offset B, the inverse has this form. This means that before applying the inverse matrix A, we have to subtract the new origin. We can use the idea of inverse matrices for tetrahedral skinning. This means we can deform a visual mesh along with the surrounding volumetric tetrahedral mesh. Let's assume we have a tetrahedron defined by the origin Q and the vectors Q1, Q2 and Q3. We also have a deformed version of the same tetrahedron defined by the origin P and the vectors P1, P2 and P3. Now we are looking for a transformation that transforms a vector x along with the tetrahedron to arrive at the position x prime. We can interpret the vectors q1, q2 and q3 as the column vectors of a matrix Q. If we transform the tetrahedron using the transformation defined by the vector Q and the inverse of the matrix Q, we get the unit tetrahedron in the regular coordinate system. Applying the transformation defined by P, P1, P2 and P3 brings us into the deformed tetrahedron. The combined transformation looks like this. We saw earlier that we can interpret the column vectors of matrix A as the axis of a deformed coordinate system. In the special case where all axes are perpendicular to each other and each axis has length 1, we have a rigid transformation. This is because no shear and no stretch is introduced. A rigid transformation is basically just a translation and a rotation. To characterize a rigid transformation, I have to introduce you to transposition. Let's say we have a matrix A. The transposed of A has the same dimension as A. 
However, we turn columns into rows. This means the element of the first column of A are now stored in the first row of A transposed. The same for the second column and for the third column, which appear now in the second row and the third row. We can do the same thing with a vector. If we transpose a vector, it turns from a column vector into a row vector. Using the idea of a transposed vector, we can now compute the dot product without a dot. For this, we multiply A transposed with B. To compute a certain entry of the resulting matrix C, we have to take the dot product of the corresponding rows and columns. Here we have only one row and one column, so our result is just one value. If we now multiply A transposed with A, we get as a result AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared, which is the length of the vector A squared. What happens if we multiply a transposed matrix with itself? In the transposed matrix, all the column vectors of R are now row vectors. If we multiply these two matrices out, we get the following structure. We have the squares of the lengths of the column vectors on the diagonal. In the off-diagonal elements, we have the mutual dot products of the column vectors. Now for rigid transformation, which is also a rotation, we know that all axes are perpendicular to each other, which means all the dot products are zero. We also know that the lengths of the axes are one, this means the diagonal entries are all 1 and we have zeros on the off diagonal elements. This means for rigid transformation or rotation we have R transposed times R is the identity matrix. We can also conclude that the inverse of a rotation matrix is just its transposed. As a side note, the deformation energy of a transformation is often measured as a function of the transformation matrix transposed times the transformation matrix minus the identity matrix. What we know from above is that for rigid transformation this expression is zero, so we get a zero deformation energy for a rigid transformation, which is exactly what we expect. In 3D we can express every rotation by a rotation axis and a rotation angle. If we define the rotation axis with a unit vector n and the rotation angle with alpha, then we can write down the rotation matrix like this. A unit vector has two degrees of freedom and a scalar has one degree of freedom. So we have three degrees of freedom for any rotation. However, if we use a matrix, we have nine values to store. To save space, we could represent any rotation by a simple vector r. r would then be n times alpha. To store r, we only need three entries. The problem of this idea is that to perform the actual rotation, we need the sine and the cosine of alpha, not alpha itself. These quantities are expensive to compute. A better way is to use a vector with four entries. In this case, we scale n not by alpha, but by the sine of alpha, and store the cosine in a separate element. This quantity is called a quaternion. Quaternions allow us to rotate vectors. We can also combine rotations by multiplying quaternions. Finding the inverse of a rotation is particularly simple. We just have to change the sine of the first three entries. Now we are ready to write 3D simulations. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I will see you in the next one.